Welcome, um, everybody, uh, back here at uh, Siegel Tor in Manhattan, uh, Midtown, and uh, it's still a bit uh, cold here, but um, we are restarting, luckily, our uh, Siegel Talks. Last week, we had the great uh, Bob uh, Wilson with us. It was a quite kind of a significant conversation, I thought, and uh, as we all know, it's one of the most beautiful things one can see on the stage have been created by him, but his outreach tool the community, his great water mill center that he created out in Long Island to be close to nature, but also to contribute to a community. This is quite stunning and truly, um, I think, extraordinary. Today, we continue and we have, uh, I think, a very significant, important and uh, meaningful uh, conversation. And a guest today is Olga Garay English. And uh, Olga is... Um, um, how would you say there would be a heaven of stars of presenters of people who support the arts and theater and performance in New York. She is one of the, uh, the, the stars, the guiding lights uh, who we listen to, who has engaged um, uh, deeply um, in the field. Olga uh, has been an independent arts consultant since 2014. And she is based in Los Angeles uh, in California. And there she works on national but also international projects. She's been a senior advisor to local and international programs to the city of Los Angeles and to the councilman Tom Labon. She is a creative strategist to UCLA Center for the Arts and Performance, the center we all admire, we look to, we at CUNY is a big, big public center, but also UCLA, you know, is something we have followed and we had many, many artists and uh, also teachers from, um, from there with us, Travis and so, so uh, many others. And she's a resource and program development for Emerson College, Office of the Arts, I think the California branch. How around where we are on is also supported by Emerson. So we are really grateful for that. I think Olga also supported How around very, very early on and was on the National um, Advisory Board. She's a senior international advisor to the Fondation Santiago Armil in Chile, the director of the California Institute of the Arts, Latin American Caribbean Latino Initiative and a visiting professor for the Calat School on Theater and Management and Planning. She's a project manager for the Ford Foundation, the great Ford Foundation, and to the US Latino Arts Future Symposium, and the senior advisor to the France Los Angeles Foundation, FLAX or FLAX. So it's a, a, a as you can see, and this is only touching um, some parts um, of her work and over decades, um, she has, um, I would say also, um, dedicated her life, work, and energy to the field of theater and performance. Olga, welcome, and sorry we made you up before nine o'clock in Los Angeles. <laughs> well, I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Frank. It's been a long time. We haven't seen each other. Oh, that's <laughs> true. That is true, as, as with so many people um, in the world. Olga, um, how are you in this time um, of Corona? Well, it's been a very difficult year, as you can imagine. Um, you know, our, our field, uh, the performing arts especially, has just been uh, completely stricken by the coronavirus lockdowns and, and various regulations. So it's really, it's been a challenging year in terms of um, trying to stay connected, trying to stay relevant, making sure that um, we as a, as a field of performing arts presenters are um, committed to keeping international cultural exchange and engagement alive and vibrant uh, now and into the future. Um, with all of the travel restrictions and all of the you know uncertainty that has that has really grab, gripped the world, um, a group of us have come together digitally. Um, as a matter of fact, the next uh, conversation I have is a Zoom call with, the, with this group. It's called the International Presenting Commons. Um, and actually HowlRound has been supplying the administrative support for this group. It's a group of about 20 of us, um, people who are committed to international cultural exchange and engagement to keep um, you know, discussing this, keep it on the front burner, not let people, you know, sort of slide into um, protectionism and uh, and really to keep the international arts ecosystem as as fully integrated as possible during these really 
very challenging times. What do you talk about when you meet? What do we talk about? We talk about everything from um, how to advocate for increased resources from both the public and private sector to, um, to keep uh, international work um, uh, fully uh, vital and, and engaged. Um, we talk about um, things like visas and, and how do you, um, how do you put together digital uh, programs so that we can uh, continue supporting the artists as they make work. Um, how do you, um, can you, how do you break the, the, the way that the business was conducted in, in the past in terms of, uh, you know, people like me just jumping on a plane to go see uh, a theater show and then turning around and coming back two days later and what an imprint that has on the planet. Um, we talk about how do you rethink what commissioning work um, should look like so that it's not as product oriented as it has been in the in the past, but really more about keeping artists um, fully present and and uh, and provide resources so that you know when we can open up again, um, there will be there will be shows that will be made. And so um, we talk about a lot of stuff. Um, how do we um, collaborate more effectively with our counterparts in other parts of the world. Um, so it's, it's, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty uh, intellectually focused group of people. Uh, we have um, some of the top presenters in the country. Um, it's at UCLA, the Center for the Arts for, for Performance. We have the Public Theater in New York, Arts Emerson, um, Stanford uh, University, um, ASU, um, Arizona State University, all, you know, some pretty major um, centers and, and, um, and, and leaders. And then we also have a handful of people that are um, creative independent producers. Um, so these are people who actually work hand in hand with artists to, um, to get the resources in place that artists need to make new work. Um, and so they are a very vital part of the delivery system that we have in this country for sure. And um, many of them um, support US artists wanting to do work abroad. And sometimes they support artists from abroad who want to come to the United States. So it's a, it's a very reciprocal kind of um, enterprise. And uh, we have been meeting since about May of last year. So almost for a full year um, and really are um, very keen on engaging with um, both public and private funders and policymakers, so that um, we can just keep this item on the table. You know, it, uh, when um, when the pandemic first hit and the lockdowns began, uh, a lot of presenters were talking about just focusing on local artists or artists who could drive from their hometown to you know where the presenters um, theater was. But that really sent a chill. Uh, and of course, this was during the past administration. So there was already a feeling that America was increasingly closing itself off from the broader global community. And so there was a real sense of urgency that, um, that people just wanted to, to um, gather uh, virtually to start just breaking down these these barriers that that keep cropping up, and so um, it's an ad hoc group. Um, people uh, uh, have been volunteering their time, although the Mellon Foundation gave us a very small amount of money um, uh, for administrative support. But um, but by and large, most of the people involved are are just you know volunteering. Um, their time because this is just such a, 
an important element of, of what the artistic programming for some of these uh, performing arts centers need to be. Um, many, uh, as you know, Frank, our, our country is very pluralistic. And um, so if our performing arts presenting colleagues are going to be um, filling the needs of the multicultural communities where they are based, um, they really need to put people on the stage that represent those diverse communities. And so um, the people that are involved in this, in this uh, international presenting commons, and we use the name commons really um, very much influenced by the work of HowlRound and, and the theater commons, um, the Latino theater commons uh, that HowlRound also um, supports because we, uh, we're committed to sharing intellectual knowledge and uh, cultural knowledge and um, really looking at this as a way of um, breaking away from competition and, and uh, oh, I have this premiere so you can't have it or I have this exclusivity clause so you can't you know present that artist within six months of me. And so there, there there have been a number of um, behaviors or practices uh, that became um, sort of entrenched in the presenting field that we're really questioning about, is that the best way to, um, to work? You know, it's not, you're not doing an artist any favors if you say, oh, if, you, if I present you at my stage, you can't, work anywhere within a, a you know 90 mile radius for the next six months you know that that kind of we're really questioning the way that we do business and 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 trying to um align our business practices with much more progressive goals and and uh and that's everything from you know, um, climate change to um, exclusivity clauses to, you know, how do you build a tour that that uh, keeps artists, you know, working and 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 secure uh, and and reaching audiences um, without some of the harmful side effects that were um, more prevalent. Yeah, well, t tell us more. What what you what are you questioning? This is a, significant for all of us to hear that you um, you know are so deeply um, engaged in a discussion that in a way was started by Corona, right? The time of Corona. Yeah, I mean it's it's an interesting side effect uh, that one of the one of the um, results or the outcomes of the Corona um, crisis has been a soul searching, if you will. Uh, of people really trying to figure out how to reshape their uh, the way they do business so that respectful of the planet and um, so that they're more collegial with each other and um, and in service to artists and so. Um, for example, uh, Art Emerson, since since uh, we're on HowlRound, one of the things that they did uh, was they have a relationship to a Chilean artist, a playwright um, named Guillermo Calderon, who is um, one of the most um, yeah, well thought of artists. Mm -hmm. Huh? He was on Siegel Talks I, too. I didn't hear you. He was yes, on our. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So. He's, uh, you know, he's a really um, extraordinary artist, and he um, very much gets his um, his uh, vision from contemporary social uh, causes. And so, um, he has been at uh, at Arts Emerson on a couple of occasions, and was supposed to be there um, during this season, but of course, because of COVID, that had to be um, that had to be uh, postponed. And so what um, David Dower, who was until very recently the artistic director of um, Arts Emerson, 
decided that he was going to give a, a $25,000 commission to Guillermo to just work on whatever he wanted to work on with no real strings attached. It wasn't like, oh, you know, we're going to give you $25,000 and we need a, you know, three act play uh, by, you know, October of 2021 that we're going to, you know, uh, show at our theater um, over a three week period. It was very much, what are you working on? Um, how can we help you get to the next level? Um, you tell us what you need. And it's a very different way of framing a commission, um, which had become much more transactional uh, of, you know, here, what are the deliverables and, you know, what is, what is the budget and, um, you know, how many people are going to be on the stage and that kind of thing. This is much more um, of a nurturing uh, of an individual artist's voice. It's like, what do you need from us to help you stay working and engaged and to keep your company going? And so, thinking more expansively about how we support artists is very much part of the discussion of this international presenting commons. Uh, are you are you guys worried about uh, uh, um, the future of international presenting in the US? Yeah, I think that um, there, well, we're more hopeful now, obviously, because the administration that is currently in the White House um, has a much more progressive um, vision as to how United, how the United States fits into the global order. And we are um, re-entering into like the Paris talks and on the environment, you know, the Iran uh, nuclear talks. We're regaining our seat at the global table on so many different topics. So far, the arts have not been, um, you know, really uh, targeted in terms of, you know, getting us back out there. But I think that conversations are starting to happen. I just um, participated in one uh, that the Kennedy School at uh, in Boston at, at um, and Harvard uh, put on last week about um, uh, international uh, cultural diplomacy and the and the role that that cultural diplomacy needs to uh, have in in our in our new administration and and how we can um, get back to that kind of soft power um, discussion of of how to deploy that uh, in a way that is not um, maybe as manipulative as it has been sometimes in the past, as you well know, that it was much more, um, you know, sort of uh, anti the Cold War, you know, it was, it, there, there was a, a, a not very mm -hmm. hidden um, strategic and tactical approach to the, it wasn't arts for art's sake, it was, you know, how do we show uh, you know, people behind the Iron Curtain or people, you know, in countries that that um, are uh, kind of on on the target of the communist bloc uh, that the United States um, offers artistic freedom and, you know, uh, nurtures uh, artistic dialogue. I think that I think that the the current vision is um, not quite as transactional as that. And, and um, you know, it's important that, that we are part of that kind of a, a global discussion, you know, because it, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful and positive um, discussion versus, you know, how do we uh, talk about nuclear disarmament, you know, so many of our global um, interactions are based on crisis and, and you know, um, you know, pandemics or, you know, climate change or whatever. And, and to have a place where positive um, cultural exchange can take place and build, um, you know, attention and, 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 and awareness and, 
and sympathy um, is something that that we can uh, offer to the globe um, in a way that you know politicians can't. You know, the artists can bring uh, a sensitivity to um, to an interaction that uh, is very rare in in other settings. Yeah, we just featured a bit of work of Milo Rao, for example, and certainly, you know, that's the case that it makes it um, so clear. And it's true that art should play a role in, in cultural diplomacy, and a good one. I do know that also after World War II, um, American abstract expressionism in painting, you know, was much highly favored than the work of the living theater, you know, or politically engaged artists on Augusto Boal or others. You know, they said, no, that's much safer. We don't, but, but still, at least it was serious engagement uh, with the arts. Louis Armstrong was a cultural ambassador. Yeah. And it's underestimated how important, you know, uh, arts is. And uh, someone once said, uh, you know, Whose set, the songs you sing, whose book you read, whose films you see, that's a, that is a, that's a powerful uh, uh, um, fiction, you know, and it is a strong one, it is important, and it's also honest, or there is free art or there is not. And, and, and I think we can um, contribute to that. And what do you think was really wrong before Corona in theater? Like, let's put aside, sorry, what do you think did not work at all? and what needs to be fixed. In theater specifically? Yeah, theater performance. I mean, to me, um, the, the regional theater movement in, in the United States, which really was um, a product of um, the Ford Foundation uh, back in the 60s, um, kind of coming up with this idea of what a, um, a cultural, community should look like. And I don't say capital, cultural capital. Um, I don't use the word capital per se because it, it connotes a very big city. To me, it connotes a very big city, sophisticated, et cetera. Um, we're talking about you know any kind of um, community that prides itself on having uh, a cultural infrastructure. And so, that meant that you had to have a theater, that meant you had to have a museum, um, uh, often a performing arts center, um, maybe a ballet company, uh, an orchestra. And uh, in the case of theater, it led to the creation of what we call the regional theater system in the United States that is still alive and thriving today. Um, I think that it was a very uh, place-based strategy. So it was about that community and what that theater meant in that town. Um, and what I think resulted is that there has been um, uh, a hermetization of theater in the United States that um, many other countries don't have, meaning uh, in many countries in Latin America and Europe, for, su for sure, um, uh, many theater companies are structured so that they are, um, so it's a touring art form so that they can go to festivals, that they can go, you know, they can be itinerant, they can go from town to town, country to country. That is much less prevalent in the United States. Um, as I said, you know, the regional theater movement tended to um, reward and prize um, being in that community. And so there, there was um, a lot less um, openness to other ideas and other, um, other ways that people worked. And so, um, so, so, a, a very American type of theater language has emerged, which is, you know, pretty inward looking, uh, whereas uh, theater in, in, in other countries is, um, has its own language and its own persona, but um, they expose themselves much more to influences that are going on in other countries. And so, I think that that's one, um, and, and also here there is, um, I think, an over-dependence on 
um, set design and um, you know the look of the production so that um, sometimes like the largest the larger theaters they spend you know half a million dollars on a set that is up for a production for three weeks and then they tear it down and it goes to landfill you know um, whereas you know in, in other places there's a lot more um, dependence on the corporal um, manifestation of, of, of the actor there's a lot more emphasis on um, sort of the imagination and and um, almost minimalist uh, set design because it's meant to tour uh, and these are huge generalizations of course it doesn't mean that there are no mm -hmm. companies here that do that there's certainly um, companies that do that um, but it's they're sort of more the exception than the rule. Mm -hmm. And I just think that, you know, uh, and, and again, in, in, in many other countries, um, there's a real uh, festival culture, which I think is, is pretty much missing in the United States. You know, um, you can count the festivals in probably in one hand that are of any, you know, major consequence. I mean, uh, for example, the, the next wave f festival, which, the Brooklyn Academy of Music um, has produced for, for, I don't know how many years, 20 years, whatever. In my mind, that's not really a festival. It's a season, you know, because it's like over a, what, four month period, it, you know, uh, performances happen individually. It's not a festival. I mean, to me, a festival is when you can go and see, you know, 20, 30 productions over a 10 day period uh, from all over the world from, you know, uh, the Lincoln Center Festival was uh, like that. And unfortunately, it's no longer available, you know, it, it no longer exists. But there's very few really world class festivals, theater festivals in the United States, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that, you know, I think I think that we really need to look at that because it it, um, it creates uh, uh, this atmosphere that is very heady, very intellectually stimulating. Um, it it really engenders dialogue uh, across cultures, and it's a it's a format that um, that I think you know the United States uh, is sorely lacking. I mean, can you think of any exceptional theater festivals that? No, I wish. You know? I wish. Yeah. I, could, I really, really do wish. And um, it's uh, stunning, as you know, we are trying to put together for June 2023. We're going to ask New York theaters to present a great work of their own, and also host someone, maybe with a group of international curators, and hopefully you can maybe also help us to do something. The Avignon Festival, the Edinburgh Festival. Yeah. Both came out after World War II, after a time yep. when there was no exchange, a time of fear, a time of death, not as uh, actually as, uh, uh, as light as Corona. It's just for us to imagine what our, you know, our ancestors went through, our forefathers, people who are yeah. still, it's uh, incredible to think really. And, um, and the older I get, more more stunned and horrified I am about what happened, especially also, of course, Germany. But I think we do need that and we will try that. I think you are right. Um, that kind of uh, the idea of the Festspiel, celebrating life, but also celebrating a city. Avignon celebrates as other people. They are proud, they see things. And there's uh, what we really miss now is exactly what theater gives us, is conversation, art, looking at things, and, and also trying at least to, to convince uh, not the people we already know are, you know, on our side, but also the ones who, um, Edouard Louis said in one of the talks on the Miller Rouse said, I write theater, so not for the people who are already convinced, for the people who are not listening, who don't understand, who maybe to help them with imagination. I think festivals can do that and they are more powerful than corn uh, demonstrations or because they have life in them and they have truth in them. And, um, but we will have to work for it. Do you, um, what do you see also, um, you're globally connected also, it's of course a lot to Latin America, maybe not, but do you see, new forms, do you see something emerging 
where you say, um, that's interesting. That's, uh, we haven't thought of that before, what people are doing at the moment or what they are planning. I mean, I think that to me, um, the whole rise of the digital language has been really an interesting uh, development. Obviously, there are um, great um, limits that uh, having to rely on a digital platform um, impose on you, but there are also liberations that the digital um, medium has uh, brought to bear, such as, you know, artists and two completely different parts of the world being able to um, collaborate on a piece because, you know, all of a sudden somebody that is based in New York can be working with somebody that's based in Sao Paulo um, digitally and create uh, a, a work that would have not been possible before. You know, they can, they can stay in their own communities and they can, they can um, collaborate with, with a number of people. I think that for me, um, the least satisfying uh, digital manifestation has been when uh, people just take three cameras and shoot a, a, a theater play that, you know, was just, they just shoot a theater play, you know, so it's still um, framed for uh, what should be a, a live experience. And that becomes kind of tedious to me. Uh, mm -hmm. the, th the, the works that I have resonated with most is our works that are conceptualized for the digital medium and that really um, take advantage of what that, um, that interaction is. For example, um, I've been involved with this, um, with this artist uh, from Chile. His name is Francisco Reyes. He's a very well-known um, uh, actor uh, and he's uh, been in film and, and television. He, he was um, in that uh, Oscar winning film from Chile a couple of years ago, um, A Fantastic Woman. He was the love interest. Anyway, about uh, six or seven years ago, he and his adult children uh, put together a very stripped down uh, version of Hamlet that they took to um, small towns throughout the, the country of Chile many of which had never seen live theater before, let alone Shakespeare. And they, you know, they, they did, uh, they introduced Hamlet to, to these um, villagers. Well, about a year ago, they decided that they were going to make a digital version. So, but instead of just filming an outdoor performance of, of the work that they had, um, that they had, uh, translated and interpreted from Shakespeare, they rethought the whole thing for the digital medium. And it became, um, uh, all of the characters were um, uh, clay puppets and uh, Francisco, the, the, the main uh, actor, read all the, or said all of the, all of the dialogue as if these, um, as if these clay figures were, you know, uh, enacting the play of, the, of Hamlet. And, um, and they did really interesting things like they spliced, um, uh, you know, film into it and they did these shadow puppets and it was just a completely uh, new show. It wasn't just we're regurgitating the show that that was supposed to be in front of a live audience is rethinking what does the digital medium um, afford you that is not um, possible in life theater. Like, you know, there was a lot of close-ups. There was a lot of, you know, focusing on the hands. There was a lot of things that if you're, you know, sitting in a, in a, in a theater with 200 other people, you would have never gotten that perspective because you'd be watching from afar. So, you know, really, um, I don't think that the digital medium is gonna go away once our theaters reopen, but I think that it's gonna become 
a um, certainly a component of how theaters enter uh, the post uh, pandemic world. Uh, and it does give you possibilities that are just that were just not really ever implemented before. I mean, they were available, but nobody really took advantage of them. I mean, even how around this platform, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a way of, um, of reaching people that um, had we been at the Siegel Center, uh, we wouldn't have been able to reach. I mean, I, I did a couple of, um, of uh, programs with you at the Siegel Center uh, over the years. And, you know, it was who managed to be in New York City and made it to, you know, to the lower side. And, and that was it. That was your audience. And now people can, you know, they can, they can tune in from Germany or, or Shanghai or, you know, Great Britain or, you know, Argentina. So it, it, it has its uh, pluses and its minuses, but I think that um, I think people are starting to really adapt to it, so that it be so that it, it's going to have a life of its own from now on, in my opinion. Wow, that's uh, quite quite a prediction. I think it's an interesting one. Uh, you know, in Germany, traditional in France, theaters have three uh, divisions: it's um, it's drama, ballet, opera. And something, yeah, there might be a fourth one, the digital branch, because it might happen again. And also the numbers of people reached uh, are enormous, um, what people experienced. And um, we, we, we will see that. And But as you say, it has to be a reinvention and, and not a double fold already so often, especially in the US theater looks like television and it looks like a reality. And then um, if you're on Zoom, then film theater, but then it lo should look like TV, but it won't look like, TV because they, you know, they know what they're doing and they're getting into that. No, we have to be like the painters and uh, sculptors who were liberated by the photo camera to say they could do their surreal work or they could work that deal directly with this um, imagination. So Olga, tell us a bit, you started out also, we, you didn't mention but in the CD, but in Miami, how was your experience for you as a, how, how did you get to your job? What you did, how did you explain as a woman? And well, you know, Latin American work. Tell us how has been. How, what was your journey? So, um, I didn't study the arts. I studied. Uh, I have a master's in community psychology, which is very different. Uh, well, it's different and it's alike in so, in certain ways. But um, um, I was in Miami. I had just uh, finished graduate school. I was working in a program. Um, you born in Miami or? No, I was born in Cuba. In Cuba. In Cuba. And I came to the United States in 1961. Um, and uh, my family was in Miami for about three years. And then we moved to Pennsylvania and New Jersey and Northern Florida, um, uh, you know, for job opportunities um, for, my, for my mother mostly. Uh, um, but I, I was uh, I was working with migrant farm workers using uh, Paulo Freire's um, liberation pedagogy um, as a means to uh, teach them reading and writing and English as a second language. And we use the arts uh, as a means of um, building community and, and building trust. But it wasn't an arts program per se. It was really more about literacy and and uh, and uh, language proficiency. Uh, and then Ronald Reagan came into power, and he uh, squashed all of those programs uh, because they were grant funded. And um, and I needed a job. And back then, um, you still looked at the want ads in the newspaper to look for a job. And there was a, a, an ad from the uh, Metro Dade um, County Department of Cultural Affairs. They were looking for somebody to run a new program called the Neighborhood Arts Program, which um, was to give grants to um, uh, artists of color and organizations of color and artists run organizations, sort of smaller and mid-sized. Um, because back then, which this is in the, 
I would say the mid 80s, uh, most of the money that the county was giving to the arts went to the opera and to the ballet and to the you know mainstream theaters. They weren't reaching um, community-based uh, ensembles or, or um, you know dance companies or whatever. And um, a lot of people applied for the job, and um, the executive director took a gamble on me. Um, and within three months or so, um, I knew that that was my life's calling that, that I just, you know, really, um, you know, just blossomed. And, um, it was a very interesting time because at the time, um, the National Endowment for the Arts, this is before the culture wars, mm -hmm. um, was really, uh, leading the conversation about, um, uh, diversity and inclusion. I don't think that we're calling it that back then. They were still talking about minorities and, you know, having a seat at the table. But, um, but, but th those conversations were happening and the, the National Endowment for the Arts was um, deliberately trying to um, include uh, people of color in uh, in their peer review panels and, and their policy discussions. And um, so, because I'm Latina, um, you know, I was just at the right place at the right time. It, there was, there was a, uh, an openness and an appetite to bring new voices to the table rather than just the SOBs, the symphonies, orchestras, and ballets, you know, the, the sort of the, the other um, tier of art making. And um, pretty soon after I got the job with, in Miami, I started being invited to serve on panels um, at the NEA and then like the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and so within a year, I was already um, getting noticed at the national level just because I was getting, and I said yes to everything, because um, I really feel that you have to be present and you have to, um, you know, you have to be open to opportunities and, and embrace them. Uh, and then within a very short period of time, I started having an international um, uh, profile. The Rockefeller Foundation um, asked me to go uh, as an evaluator to a gathering of about 15 or so, um, they didn't call themselves presenters because th that, that sector was not very well defined in Latin America at the time, but they were um, uh, art makers that also helped other artists um, get their work shown. So they were, um, they were having, uh, they, they, um, look to the National Performance Network here in the United States as a model. And they were having the first meeting in uh, Parachi, Brazil, um, of people from all over Latin America who were, you know, who were acting as presenters in their communities. And uh, the Rockefeller Foundation uh, had given them um, seed money um, but they weren't sure if there was, um, if, if creating a network similar to the National Performance Network um, made sense. And it made total sense because especially back then, but even today, um, it was much more likely that um, an artist or a company would look to Europe and sometimes to the United States, but especially to Europe as kind of their North Star, and they didn't have any relationship to the country next door, right? So an Argentine uh, theater company had more um, of an opportunity to present their work at a festival in Italy, for example, than uh, going to Peru, which, you know, was just, you know, up the continent. And so, uh, we created something called La Red Latinoamericana de Productores de Arte Contemporáneo. And, and uh, it was, uh, you know, I went from being the evaluator um, 
to becoming very much part of the discussion because I, I was part of the National Performance Network. So I knew very well how it would function, what, what the parameters were, what the structure was. So um, I volunteered to write a proposal on their behalf to the Rockefeller Foundation, which I did when I got back to the States and uh, Rockefeller gave them $750,000 to get started. And they funded uh, this network for 10 years. So they gave over seven and a half million dollars uh, over that 10 year period. Plus I also helped them get money from the Ford Foundation and AT&T. And, you know, I was kind of the, the interlocutor, if you will, uh, between this group of Latin American um, presenters and uh, the United States, because uh, the, the money was here. Um, so I helped to unlock that. Uh, and that really, uh, you know, gave me a, a very significant role to play in, uh, in Latin America ever since then, because, you know, I, I was really the go-between, um, you know, the, the philanthropic community and the artistic community. And, you know, it's a role that I still play today. Mm -hmm. I'm um, very involved with Fundación Teatro Mil in Santiago. I've been working with them since 2014. Um, and uh, do everything from help uh, Chilean artists to come to the US and beyond to, you know, uh, I've helped them go to Hong Kong and, and, and different parts of the world to show their work. And uh, I also curate American artists to go to the festival that they put on every year. Um, it, I think it's one of the top three international festivals in all of Latin America. And, um, and, you know, artist Bob Wilson has been there a couple of times, actually, you said you, that you had Bob on your program uh, recently, uh, but uh, Elevator uh, Repair Service, uh, the Wooster Group, um, uh, the Actors Gang here from Los Angeles, Tim Robbins Company has been down there. Um, I've helped them uh, get work from Cuba because I, you know, I'm Cuban. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I really don't uh, limit myself to just um, uh, the, the exchange between the U.S. and Latin America. I really see myself as an internationalist and I, you know, I'm just as, uh, as prone to, um, to promote a work from a Chinese playwright that I've seen. I've, I've just been in touch with um, Wang Chong, who, who uh, presented a work at, at under the radar um, about three years ago that was just stunning. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to get them to Chile. And um, so, you know, it's really about um, being impacted by the work. You know, when, when a work speaks to you, um, it doesn't matter where it comes from, you know, you just want to share it and, 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 uh, and support it. And so that's been, my um, philosophy throughout my 30 plus year career is like, you know, be present, be engaged, um, you know, speak your passion, um, promote collaboration, all of the, all of the things that, uh, all of the positive things that um, being involved in the arts can afford a human being. And that sometimes uh, are just, absent because it, it becomes a commodity or it becomes a, a business. And um, I think that uh, it's a shame and it's to our detriment when, when we don't focus on the many positive things that the arts bring to humanity. Mm. What, 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 are, what are the lessons you learned in over all these decades? What are the important ones for everybody also starting out or young uh, curator artists, people like you who are in between cultures who are putting things together, you as a woman, as a Latina, as an organizer in general, what, what, is, what has impact what you learned, what worked? Well, I mean, I think that, that um, again, understanding your, your own motivation and understanding what you bring to the table is a critical part of um, you know 
finding a seat at the table, right? So, so know yourself, know your strengths, know your weaknesses, know what you're passionate about. Um, and, you know, just make, make things happen. Uh, you know, don't wait for somebody to tap you on the shoulder and say, um, oh, what if, you know, it's make work. One of the best things that you need to, that people who are entering the business need to learn is how do you raise money? How do you write a grant? How do you review a grant? How do you um, bring financial resources um, to bear, but also intellectual resources? How do you connect people? And I think that you know, having that um, realization that uh, this is a business that, you know, you don't just, most people don't just go into a studio by themselves and compose a big work of art, you know. Uh, you were talking earlier about the abstract expressionists, you know, they could go into a studio and make a, a painting on their own. And, you know, that that was kind of like the iconic thing to do, right? The 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 artist in the in the ivory tower and the and the garret um, just um, imagining things. Um, you know, the performing arts are a lot more um, interactive and and they require uh, people working together. And so uh, I think that that um, being again being present and 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 going to listen to things like this like this program or you know tuning into how round or you know showing up at a festival even if you don't have a you know a function there just see work see what artists are you know saying and which ones really speak to you and discuss it you know uh, talk to your peers about it um De develop a vocabulary that that is you know perceptive and intelligent and grounded and and um just be in the community be out there um and i think that you know the more you make happen the more people will come to you because they know that you deliver and they know that that you can make things happen for them. And so I think that that those are the those are the, you know, they seem obvious, but a lot of people, you know, just sit around and expect to be tapped on the shoulder and discovered or something. You know, it's really about um, being part of, you know, a, a, a larger community. I mean, the fact that Melanie Joseph, a dear friend of both of ours, um, said you should talk to Olga because she's she's dealing with international, um, you know, matters. Um, you know, that's an act of of um, proactive engagement, right? It's it's how do you connect people that that are in different places in your orbit so that. Um, new dialogue can be engendered and uh you know that that to me is um is a very giving um stance and and persona and i think that that's what you need to that's what people need to lead with is how do i become i mean that's why um the concept of the commons is so intriguing because it's really um it debunks competition. It, it is about collective good and collective um, uh, creating a collective path forward in 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 the most um, you know um, deliberate and um, and philosophically healthy terms. And I think that you know, as a society, uh, the more that we can that we can permeate everything we do with those kinds of values and ideals, um, it comes back to you. Those, those, those actions and, and, and those belief systems um, have a way of, of um, 
you know, making you attractive to people in, 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 in the deepest sense of that word. Yeah, that is true. And also things are possible as the great work of the Foundry Theater and not only um, 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 shows. You said, you know, so many machine, theater machines were designed to do plays and we love them, you know, like it, but like in a museum, there's a variety of paintings, of colors, of projections, of what, that's also what we need. And the Foundry has done that. Had, stunning how complicated it is for them to get funded and to do the work but there is um it also shows it is uh, possible in, in many uh, many ways um it's getting slowly closer um, to the end before i ask you what you're working on who else do you follow who are theater artists companies and um, no you don't want to play favorites but something that just comes to your mind we think this is at the moment and that's meaningful to me that's an interesting question. I uh, I really uh, think that the work that is coming out of uh, Latin America, which is very socially engaged, um, is finding resonance uh, with me right now because you know, with all the racial injustice protests and all the all of the reckoning that we're coming to as a country. Um, you know, grappling with uh, grappling with those themes is uh, is really important. I just saw a piece that uh, Dale Orlander Smith uh, did uh, after the flood, uh, dealing with um, the killing of Michael Brown and how it impacted uh, the community in St. Louis and Ferguson, um, and you know, people who are bringing those kinds of issues to to bear, uh, to bear witness uh, are really meaningful to me right now. I'm working right now on a really interesting project actually um, that tells this very um, uh, little known tale about uh, a program that the president of the Philippines uh, initiated during World War II to give refuge to um, Jewish families fleeing uh, Nazi Germany. And it's uh, over a thousand uh, Jewish families uh, were harbored in the Philippines. And uh, a very, um, I find him, a, you know, just a, a, an extremely talented and delightful playwright, Boney B. Alvarez, who's Filipino himself, um, is going to write the story. Uh, the, it's, a, it's a true story. Um, told by a gentleman named Ralph Price, who's now 90, 90 years old. And he uh, was invited to the United Nations to tell his story. But he went with his family when he was eight years old. I was eight years old when I came to this country from Cuba. Um, and um, we, we chose Boney uh, as a playwright very deliberately because he has this kind of magical realism touch to um, to the works that he that he creates that I thought would really um, bode well for telling the story from the point of view of an eight-year-old child or a 10-year-old child um, versus a, a sort of a more typical melodramatic Holocaust story. I really um, wanted to bring that sense of his daughter, um, Jacqueline, said that, you know, her father saw the world war during, you know, through the eyes of a child. And how do we tell that, that story that doesn't belie the horror, but also so shows uh, the magical elements. They, they wound up being um, on a mountain uh, with guerrilla fighters and uh, other, and Filipino uh, families that were hiding from the Japanese invaders. So, you know, the, the, the idea is to tell this, what was a tragic uh, story at, at, at a very real level uh, with this other story of empathy and uh, a poor country reaching out to, uh, to a peoples and to give them safe harbor when it, the country, you know, was economically very precarious stage itself. And so, there's a there's a, a beautiful metaphor in there, um, so that's that's something that that we just started working on and um, and hopefully it'll be ready 
to tour uh, in 2022, 23 season. Fantastic. So, yeah. As they once sang, in the year 25, 25. <laughs> you know, but it will happen. Listen, Olga, we are getting close um, to the end. And I know you have to join that significant, important also um, a group of international arts presenters. Thank you for, you know, for, for caring uh, with your group and your people for us to create work and to make it happen that we can see um, something outside the tunnel vision of the US, the Penn World Voices, Penn, the Writers Organization always says 95% of all books are American books. You can buy books just are British, uh, mostly American, the rest 5%, half of them are French or German because they are supported by there's only two, two books out of 100. And the same, I guess, is with place. Wow. Maybe we even have a worse record who knows? So um, this is important. Uh, we feel uh, we are on your side and also our work has been part of it. Really, really uh, thank you and congratulations on going on. Also tell us, thank you for telling us a bit about, you know, your your, your project and where you, how you got to this um, this field. So it's important to everybody, she said, listen to what's happening in Latin America. So this is a, a significant um, uh, hint from everybody just, and we believe that too. And um, so this is of uh, importance. And um, what she said, don't wait for someone, you know, to tap you on the shoulder or as Susan Sontag said, don't wait till society kisses you on the forehead and then you do something, get a diploma, engage, listen, participate and show that you care and, uh, and contribute. So really, really, thank you, Olga. Uh, thank for you, Frank. Thank you for inviting me and, and stay in touch. And if you're gonna do this festival, I'd love to be involved. Thank you, and uh, thank you for being such a good friend to the Siegel Center, but also to HowlRound and also, you know, to, to the Los Angeles uh, community and, uh, and internationally, the bridge you created, and these are real bridges. And yes, it goes back to a foundation like a Rockefeller Foundation, so we're going to take a chance, like someone took it on you, they also took a chance on an idea, and it has been so important and significant. Um, we're going to continue this week. Tomorrow we have John Glover from the New York Youth Symphony and the on-site opera. They do fantastic work, uh, often unannounced uh, in stores and behind. And uh, we're going to hear uh, more from uh, John. And on Friday we have Peja Musijevic, and he's going to talk about the Baryshnikov Art Center, but also about the Tippett uh, uh, Rice Art Center. So. Um, and I, both of them um, do create inter interesting work in this time of uh, Corona. Elizabeth Hayes suggested us also to connect to them. So um, we will hear what can be done. And, um, and to our listeners, really thank you for taking time. When we started last March, we were one of the only people doing these talks in the time of Corona. We did it actually five times a week. We were the only institution worldwide in the theater that produced content every day. And we talked to over 150 artists from 50 countries, and we are continuing now. But also with the outlet, what can we do now? We want to do something, want to be part of it. We cannot also just talk. We also have to do something, but it is important to listen. And it was great to listen to you today, Olga, and thank you for sharing. And everybody, you at home, really thank you for taking your time. It means a lot to us um, that you uh, participate. And thanks to Halron. Thank you. Bye bye. And thank you. Only three minutes late for the talk. Say hi to everybody. <laughs> Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank you, bye.